this morning. And we're very happy to have with us Dr. Nurul Alia Idris. And she's actually a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Science Marine Environment at University of Malaysia, Trangganu. And she's a rather special candidate because she joined us um, through a Ministry of Higher Education fellowship, which allows young lecturers to do postdoctoral attachments. And we're lucky that she chose Seba for her attachment, and we're delighted to have her with us. She'll be with us for 12 months, and, and I think that started from uh, 1st of December, so till end of November this year. And I think at the moment you're still in Trangano, right? But we hope you <laughs> come yes. and see us sometime when, when uh, the uh, MCO maybe is less strict. Uh, anyway, we, we look forward to working together, whether you can come here or not, mm -hmm. okay? So, um, Dr. Alia holds a PhD in plant cell and molecular biology from University of Canterbury, Christchurch in New Zealand. And her research is on specialized cell walls in the roots of the orchids of genus Miloniopis. If I said that wrong, I'm sure she will correct me. <laughs> her research is focused on cytoskeletal organization of specialized secondary cell walls, especially thigh thickenings that can be induced by abiotic stress. And she currently works on lipid transfer proteins localizing in the orchid mycorrhizal interaction. And she's helping to uh, upskill herself in metagenomics as she works with us in her postdoctoral fellowship research. And so um, we welcome her very much to uh, be a member of SEBA. And uh, please, uh, Dr. Alia, please present your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Jenny. Uh, I'm very um, happy to be with Seba. Um, I think it's the perfect uh, place uh, for me, uh, as I have chosen as a postdoctoral uh, research fellow, because um, it is, I think it um, uh, represents something that is actually quite lacking in UMT. <laughs> um, so let me just uh, give me a while to, uh, to get my slides up, not this one. I'm not actually familiar with Google um, uh, Google Meet because in UMT here, we actually use uh, WebEx. So, tab. Uh, your entire screen. Okay, so I think, um, okay, so let's start. So, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Uh, as Prof. Jedi introduced me just now, my name is Nurul Alia Idris, and I am actually from University of Malaysia, Trangganu. I actually received my uh, PhD uh, in 2016 from the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. And, um, I would like to share with you all today um, a topic that I actually did for my PhD, but I think is very re relevant to SEBA. So SEBA, the Center of uh, Research in Agriculture, Bi Biote Biotechnology in Agriculture. So of course, I, uh, I bet everyone is um, familiar with plants and abiotic stresses. So with a continuously growing population in the world, um, of course, the issue of foods, food security, and this is further complicated by climate change uh, and uh, it affects crop uh, productivity. So abiotic stresses, uh, meaning extreme temperatures, it can be the, the drought and uh, soil salinity, and these are the major environmental conditions that often plant and our crops have to encounter. So we need to know how the plants perceive these uh, stresses, uh, how signals are transduced in the plants itself, and the, re the, the response to all these abiotic stresses. And of course, eventually, um, how they are genetically determined. So to, of course, to deal with these uh, abiotic stresses, plants have evolved special adaptive mechanisms. And this is why I want to share with you all the structure called five thickenings. Okay, 
so this is the outline of my talk today um i i i uh, will first introduce what are fire thickenings and and then delve into their cell developmental biology with looking at the microtubule organization during its uh, development and also some composition of the fine thickenings itself with callus and also wheat gem agglutinin deposition. And then we will continue with the induction and the roles played by the fine thickenings. And there are several factors there. And of course, the conclusion and my future work. <clears throat> so what uh, what are fire thickenings? So all my uh, uh, research or experiments shown here are mostly carried out in the tropical terrestrial orchids, Miltoniopsis, from Jenny is Miltoniopsis. And so unless stated otherwise, um, it can, uh, there are several other um, example species of crops uh, that I will mention as well. And I will be using indirect immunofluorescence technique um, or fluorescence staining techniques uh, via confocal microscopy. So what are phi thickenings? So if you look at this image here, this is an image of a cross-section of the Miltoniopsis root. Uh, the phi thickenings are specialized secondary cell walls in the root cortical cells. So maybe just a refresher of uh, plant physiology. So we have our vascular here, vascular tissue here. This is the cortical cell layer. And for orchids, they have a special epidermis or what we call the velamen layer here. So when, we, when, when I talk about five thickenings, I talk about secondary thickenings in this cell layer. So they actually form reticulate bands. So reticulate, another word for net-like, and they actually aligned between adjacent cells. And they are formed due to highly localized deposition of cellulose and also lignin. So since they are thickenings. And they are called phi thickenings because they actually resemble the Greek letter phi. Let me, uh, a good example here. Um, the Greek letter phi in cross sections. So that's why that's, uh, they are named phi thickenings. So, uh, five thickenings can be categorized into three types based on the location of the cortical cell layer. So type one, uh, the five thickenings would be in the enormous layer of the cortex, so near to the endodermis. Type two would be outermost layer, so most near to the epidermis. And we have the type three, where it's an intermediate and it can be single or multiple layers of cells. So for Miltoniopsis here, you can see that the phi thickenings is a uh, type three. So this uh, confocal image um, stained with berberine hemisulfate, you can see this is a longitudinal section and um, this is a rendered 3D image, uh, Z-stack, uh, confocal microscopy image. You can see that it is reticulate, net-like. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> the five thickenings occur in various plants, crops. Um, it can be angiosperms and gymnosperms, monocots and dicots. So basically, over 100 plant species have been identified from 16 families. And uh, observation and their inducement or role uh, have been observed in uh, broccoli, so just mentioning some of the uh, work that have been done, uh, carob, uh, and then there's maize, apples, um, geranium, pelargonium, and here this is my Miltoniopsis orchid. So it was actually very lucky for me to be actually working with a very beautiful uh, plant. <clears throat> and talking about uh, five thickenings, um, they have also, uh, always been compared in the beginning to the Casparian strip that is actually uh, that is present in the endodermis because of their location and their apparently similar uh, thickened structure. So this I just got from uh, this got, I got this from Google. This is the Casparian strip. So, um, however. Uh, our studies have found that compared to the Casparian strip, uh, five thickenings, uh, 
uh, sorry, Casparian strip is it's continuous. It's lignified and also suburized, uh, meaning have the composition of suburin. Um, secondary uh, five thickenings uh, are not suburized, and they can also can also show discontinuous structures uh, scattered all over the cortical layer. They are often irregular uh, with the formation of branching, um, and sometimes they align, sometimes they, they do not align uh, between the cells. When they align, they will be a perfect five thickening. If not aligned, sometimes we just call them thorn. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Greek symbol thorn, so half a half a five. So um, you can see these images here that I did some staining to look at the composition of the five thickenings. And this is um, fluoroglucinol, which is a, a lignin stain. So it is stained red, the five thickenings. And I have here mole stain. Uh, it shows a brown staining of both uh, the five thickenings and also the vascular cylinder. So this is more specific. It can uh, detect the presence of G or S lignin. So here it shows that uh, five thickenings have G lignin. And to test for suburization, I use two stains, berberine hemisulfate and also floral yellow. So they both are said to uh, um, stain for suburin, but we found that berberin is more specified to uh, lignin and floral yellow, um, I'm sorry, berberin can stain lignin and suburin, but floral yellow is more specific. So you can see that the five thickenings here are, this is the endodermis, the five thickenings do not um, emit the same uh, fluorescence as the endodermis, which is uh, suburized. So um, as a wall thickening, uh, the formation is also, uh, is also expected to be different from the xylem as well, because we have uh, observed that um, the five thickenings are not linked to programmed cell death. So let's continue with five thickening development. So, Organization of uh, microtubule arrays uh, plays an important role in the development of the cell wall. So here we use uh, indirect inflorescence with monoclonal antibody anti-alpha um, tubulin and confocal microscopy to actually track micro microtubule organization during phytokin development. So microtubule organization in cells developing phytokinins, they differ greatly from surrounding cells where um, you can see here oblique, we usually call them oblique um, organization uh, and space evenly throughout the cell. But it, microtubules associated with developing five thickenings, they ran parallel along the developing five thickenings where formation could be determined with, we use polarized light, uh, but uh, with polarized light only faint autofluorescence, so meaning it is just beginning to form. In the intermediary stage of development, there are fewer uh, microtubules present, though so they still run uh, parallel. So here, uh, <clears throat> uh, but here you can see in the second panel increased autofluorescence. And uh, finally, the C panel down here, uh, mature five thickenings have strong autofluorescence but they lack any association with the microtubules. So they're suggesting that the cellulose deposition um, has actually ended. So the development of five thickenings in the Miltoniopsis is consistent with longitudinal uh, orientated cellulose um, in other five thickenings uh, in, uh, I think it's pelargonium in geranium. Um, that has been done with electron microscopy. Um, and it's actually typical cytoskeletal studies of secondary um, cell wall development that uh, show the dynamics of microtubule uh, organization. Um, 
that is actually associated with secondary cell wall patterning. So uh, during the study, um, several novel features were also discovered concerning the composition of the fire thickening uh, cell wall. So first, it must be noted that the developing wall is, like I said earlier, that it's not lignified. And then lignification um, uh, only beginning after the secondary cell wall deposition begins. And then we found that callus is associated with the, sec uh, the, de the developing wall. So callus is a, a plant polysaccharide um, regularly found at the plasmodesmata and cell plate during cytokinesis, um, but is also known to be deposited in the cell wall as a response to wounding or pathogen infection. So callus synthase uh, produces callus located at the plasma membrane. And uh, callus have been also observed in many other um, uh, sites. So we have during pol de uh, pollen development, pollen tube growth, cell plate formation, plasmodes matter regulation, functional megaspore selection, uh, a and our the most interesting would be for abiotic and also biotic response. <clears throat> so immunolabeling with antibodies. Uh, against uh, callus, which is using the NT13 uh, beta D glucan, showed consistent uh, deposition of callus in the cell wall pit fields. So, like like the microtubules, we have the callus uh, 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 staining, autofluorescence to show the growth of the five thickenings, and then just an overlay so that you can see um, the difference. So, like the microtubules, callus labeling was present in developing fire thickenings that was characterized by the less intense autofluorescence. So, developing fire thickenings here. Um, and then we actually counter stained with cellulose, the cellulose stain uh, calcofloor white uh, to actually increase the fluorescence of the cell walls. So, to so that we can see uh, where the callus localization uh, is. So uh, the textured deposition of callus in developing uh, fire thickenings uh, with patterns running, uh, patterns like this fibril-like and also textured uh, with maybe a running parallel to microtubules. So these are consistent with callus deposition um, with microtubules. <clears throat> Another um, uh, basically protein here, wheat germ agglutinin, um, was uh, observed to be related to associate with fire thickening uh, development. So we actually use fluorescently tagged w, uh, WGA. Um, it's actually extensively used before to label chitin in cell walls of fungi. fungi. And uh, during the investigation, I was actually looking at orchid mycorrhizas uh, in the Miltoniopsis and observed that the stain actually also um, stained uh, developing fine thickenings. So it behaved in a similar uh, way to callus labeling uh, present in uh, the early development of fine thickenings. So uh, for your information, WGA, it actually binds specifically to uh, glucosamine and sialic acid. So commonly found in peptidoglycans, chitins. Um, that's why uh, it was initially used to label the orchid mycorrhizas. But um, some studies have shown that uh, WGA can bind to plant tissues during the development of secondary wall in xylem. So um, uh, consistent there. <clears throat> so that's uh, 
a bit on the cell development of the five thickenings. And this is where I want to, uh, I think it gets to the interesting part because when we want to relate it to the abiotic stresses. So, um, like I said before, we can find five thickenings in a whole variety of plants. And uh, I think I forgot to mention even in brassicas. So, uh, the wide distribution, it, it suggests a, deli a deliberate response um, to plant stress. And very important, maybe very important for root growth. So, even though the roles played by uh, they are present in a, the, a whole variety of plants, the exact mechanism is still unclear. So, <clears throat> uh, some roles have been uh, suggested. Uh, these are to regulate solute uptake, to defend against uh, pathogens, penetration by fungal hyphae, um, mechanical, uh, by stabilizing the root, and then uh, as a response to environmental stresses, and of course to um, allow the root to overcome high soil, uh, prob high problematic soil. So for this part of my talk, um, some induction and uh, some induction uh, studies um, here uh, in Miltoniopsis, in Brassicas, and also here in the Alpine uh, Crest. Um, uh, Alpine Crest. First off, um, like I said before, uh, five thickenings have been related to the Casparian strip. So when we when we talk about the Casparian strip, um, we we'll, we think about regulation of solute uptake. But the ability to uh, for a small solutes to pass, uh, so through the apoplast, uh, through the cell walls, thickened by five thickenings. So was tested um, with small membrane impairment fluorescent uh, traces. So here we use calcoflow white as the uh, fluorescent tracer. And the diffusion of the calcoflow white was not blocked by the five thickenings. Um, and actually this was shown in studies in apple and geranium roots as well. Um, but if you look here at A, they were, they were blocked by the endodermis. <clears throat> so um, here you cannot see, the blue is actually the calcofloral white fluorescence, and in the, end, in the vascular tissue, there is no penetration, there's no blue uh, fluorescence in that. Um, but we have this control where the um, roots were not sealed, and we can see that the um, pen, the cocoa floor white indeed actually went into the vascular tissue. <clears throat> and um, second, five thickenings do not limit fungal infection. So there has been suggestion that five thickenings suggest, uh, block the penetration of um, ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, from, the vascular uh, from the vascular cylinder. Um, so what we did was we uh, isolated uh, some orchid mycorrhiza. So here, uh, Tulasnella species. And uh, was used to reinfect the orchid explants and grown on agar uh, in a slanting double culture experiment. So in these plants that have been infected, the fungal pelotons here, the P, which is an indicator of the presence of orchid mycorrhiza, the infection of orchid mycorrhiza in the roots, uh, they actually form 14 days after the co-culture, but five thickenings was not uh, induced. And uh, these experiments demonstrate that the five thickening induction in Miltoniopsis is independent of the infection of roots by orchid mycorrhiza. Here you can see extensive in D, extensive fungal pelotons, 
which are present in the roots of sterile agar grown plants, um, but they had no type phytokinin present. <clears throat> to investigate how water stress can induce phytokinins, um, Miltoniopsis plantlets were, that lacked phytokinins were transplanted from in vitro culture. So we found that on agar, they do not, they do not uh, produce any phytokinins. Uh, so trans, uh, plants were transferred from in vitro culture to different uh, treatments that represent an increasing degree of compaction and ability to retain water. So we have um, commercial orchid mix that's made of uh, big chunks. Uh, so it, this provided the least compaction and lower water retention. And we have the uh, medium-sized pieces of fur bark, pine bark, and medium-sized fur bark with pieces of sphagnum moss here. And then soil that consists of fine uh, fur bark. Uh, so the, the soil passed through a six millimeter diameter soil sieve. So this mix is actually the, the most compact and the best for water retention. So five thickenings remain absent from uh, agar culture roots for the entire 20 weeks of the experiment. Uh, in transfer, uh, after 10 weeks, the, the plants were watered twice a week and it was observed that in the two less compact and better drained substrate, the orchid mix and the bark treatments, uh, the five thickenings grew. You can see the plus here. So grew at the 10 week mark, but the two uh, others did not. So from here, we wanted to stress, uh, we wanted to test for water stress. So, <clears throat> The water uh, frequency was uh, was um, reduced after that to only just once a week, and because of that, after four weeks, five thickenings were also induced in the pine bark and the soil. <clears throat> uh, of course, um, after four weeks, ninety percent of the plants uh, actually uh, died due to the water stress. So, uh, from there. Um, the, these five thickenings are thought to provide uh, maybe a mechanism to support during the period of the water stress. And finally, or not final, and uh, next, this is a more recent, um, five thickenings as a salt stress response. So using roots uh, of brassicas, uh, on agar plates, it was shown that um, salt and sucrose can induce the formation of the fire thickenings. So in actually a diverse range, what they tried was a, um, a, a variety of brassica varieties um, and within the genus brassica. And uh, previous uh, studies have shown that both brassica oleracea and brassica napus demonstrated the formation of five thickenings. Uh, so it's a very cultivar specific. Uh, growth of the five uh, of the seedlings on four days agar plates. So what they did was half MS salts uh, supplemented with up to 80 millimolar uh, sodium chloride salt. And the uh, whole roots were fixed, cleared, and stained for lignin using basic, just basic fusion. Uh, and from there, a scoring system was uh, uh, based on the counts. They, they counted the number of the induced fire thickenings within a set length of the cleared root. So in Brassica napus, 80, 80 millimolar sodium chloride induced the strongest development of fire thickenings. And uh, based on the scoring system, the response curve to salt stress uh, showed that the uh, fire thickenings formation increased with the salt concentration. And for here in B, uh, synapsis alba or uh, synapsis alba white mustard, uh, five day root treated with here for 1% sucrose induced the formation of fire thickenings. 
So in the innermost cortex. Dr. Arya, can you wrap it up soon, please? Oh, okay. Thank you. And this is the final. This is the final inducement. Um, I just uh, wanted to mention that in terms of heavy metal tolerance, in the uh, alpine penny crest, I'll speak um, they found periendodermal thickenings or PETs that are induced by heavy metals. But uh, the PETs are, they are called PETs because they resemble a half moon instead of a phi. But based on the location and the composition, they can actually be consider, uh, considered as five thickenings as well. So um, with that, I would like to conclude that um, the five thickenings for me, especially, fascinating structures that uh, have various response uh, in relation to responses to abiotic stresses in plants. So we suggest that they stabilize the, the root, uh, me mechanically strengthen the root, and the varied fire thickening induction response uh, in different plant species, they have multiple adaptive roles, not just one role, probably. And the latest uh, research showing that fire thickenings, even in one genus, can be uh, cultivar independent. Maybe that one, that this is where um, I think we, I can go into genetic pathway analysis to see how they are induced. Um, because there would be, they can be one cultivar would be one cultivar would be the, the the deficient mutant and the other cultivar can be the expression mutant. So of course this would be beneficial in terms of uh, in brassica and also in other crops uh, in the development of resistance to abiotic stress. Um, before I end my uh, talk, I actually want to. Um, share some other works that I work on, which is the uh, plant microbe interaction, specifically looking at orchid mycorrhizas and lipid transfer proteins. And most recently, um, I have started some work on vanilla breeding. We, uh, we have a team uh, working on vanilla here, and we have contacts with our industrial partner, Amani Vanilla Tamalo. So I think uh, this can uh, be a, a, a big group, a very interesting group, especially with SEBA as an uh, 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 center for for biotechnology in tropical agriculture. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, since I am a, a postdoctoral uh, research fellow from UMT uh, in UM, I am very um, um, looking forward for uh, collaborations. And um, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Alia. So that was a, a beautiful presentation. I think you've shown us that uh, Miltoniopsis is not only uh, beautiful outside, but also inside. So it's uh, um, lovely uh, micrographs that you're sharing with us. Uh, I open it for maybe just one question because we are we are running a little bit late, and other people may be joining for just one of the talks. So. Um, are there any questions? You can uh, turn on your mic or you can type it into the chat box if, if there's any questions. Maybe then I can just ask one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, you're saying that you maybe want to look at the genetic pathways. Do you, do you have any... Mm -hmm. um, uh, idea which of the uh, signaling pathways might be involved for the abiotic stress response that, that leads to the phi thickenings? Um, right now, uh, where uh, I would like to start most probably would be for secondary th thickening development first. So maybe the NEC uh, related to xylem, I'm not sure yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is something um, that I wanted to maybe go to uh, come to Seba and discuss further, further because in terms of genetic pathways, um, in terms of abiotic stresses, I think there's a lot of pathways we can look at um, because since we're talking about uh, any abiotic stress right now. We have heavy metals and salt and also um, water stress. But with the um, system that I'm looking at, uh, looking at brassicas and their salt tolerance, uh, maybe uh, uh, I think um, uh, related to a pathway related to salt stress. 
Okay, yeah, uh, we, we are definitely interested in that and also um, drought stress, uh, which, you know, both, both are a little bit complicated because salt also uh, uh -huh. overlaps with the drought. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. And there's so many uh, pathways going on. But yes, I think, and I think your idea of using the um, different uh, species that have, uh, you know, different... Um, uh, it's just that one problem is we have not actually observed um, Five thickenings in Arabidopsis, so that's one thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, I think I think um, it it doesn't really matter. Not everything has to be done in Arabidopsis. So mm -hmm. Of course, it does complicate your life to, <laughs> to work in <laughs> systems. But um, Arabidopsis is not that easy to work in either. We find uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't, doesn't like Malaysia; it's too hot for it. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I don't see uh, any hands raised. Um, Anybody want to say something? Oh, Jenny, Ardiana here. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Alia, it's a nice presentation. Um, and I have some, some idea on how to look at the pathways, um, mm -hmm. looking at genetics. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I also need to read some more about uh, fighting. Mm -hmm. But um, for secondary cell wall formation, um, especially for xylem formation, um, there's a lot of, um, how to say, um, transcription factors, um, mm -hmm. regulators known to initiate this. And since we know that fire thickening also involves secondary cell wall thickening and cellular mm -hmm. deposition and all, I'm not sure whether this um, upstream uh, regulators might also be involved in fire thickening. Um, we can do some testing, identify some, some um, how to say, um, um, common um, transcription factors mm -hmm. that can possibly initiate fire thickening. Mm -hmm. um, some idea to throw yeah thank you so um that's why i said i'm looking forward to to discussing further on this um because i think we have a system that um with uh plants that we can test and uh look at uh, different genetic pathways um so just getting it started i think yeah, we can discuss it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds like we need to have a, a follow-up meeting maybe with a, a group who, who are interested. You can let Seba know if you, you would be interested mm -hmm. to join um, a separate meeting that we will have shortly uh, in, with Dr. Alia. Um, and we can set that up for, for group discussion. So um, thank you very much for your, for your questions and comments, Dr. Adiana, as well. Thank you.